The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Scripture to the first chapter of the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1, we'll read the first verse there and then skip down to verse 10 through 20. Isaiah chapter 1, beginning with verse 1 there. The vision of Isaiah, son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Listen to the teachings of our God, you people of Gomorrah. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord. I've had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asked this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. Your new moons and your appointed festivals my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O oh God, we pray for ears to hear, ears that hear your words, not mine, hearts that are open to receive what you have for us, Lord, so that we may hear what it is you call us to do, so Lord, we may be the people you call us to be. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Well, back when I was in seminary, there was one class we all had to take called just simply worship. Dr. Terry York taught that class, and some of you may know his name. Dr. York uh, was the project coordinator for the 91 Baptist Hymnal, which used to be the new hymnal, but 91, you know, a few years ago. He wrote a couple of hymns, and we sang most of them in chapel. Uh, but Dr. York was our professor in that class, and it was in a sort of auditorium-style classroom we had at the seminary. And toward the end of the semester, what we had to do was break up into groups of four or five and all come up with a worship service, and not do the worship service, but present it and explain why we chose what songs we chose, why we chose what style, what scriptures, these sorts of things. And it was pretty interesting. People would get up and say, well, here's our worship service, and, and maybe it played out like ours. You know, we got a call to worship, an invocation, a couple of hymns, a sermon, offering, that sort of thing. One that stuck out to me was my friend Jeff's. Jeff is, is a bit of a, a, well, I think we call him a character in the South. Jeff's group had a DC Comics Heroes service. Like there was like a Batman anthem, a Superman offering, these sorts of things. Uh, Dr. York gave him high marks for creativity, but that was about it. But what really started to happen, there was a lot of conversation that happened until one group got up and they presented their service. And Dr. York was sitting in a chair over on the side, his, his legs crossed, and he sort of looked up at the rest of us in our little seats at the table and said, was something missing from their worship service? Now, truth be told, others who had presented didn't have sermons, and some of them just had little reflection time. Some of them didn't have uh, other things, like one group didn't have any hymns or any Christian songs at all. They were using their service to reflect on popular music. And so a few folks looked around and said, what? No, and then Dr. York kind of had a wry smile, and someone raised their hand and said, where's the offering? 
I know, now, honestly, I knew the people in that group, and I think, frankly, they just forgot. One of them said, oh, well, uh, what, that this make-believe church, uh, we don't have an offering during the service. We don't want to offend anybody. We just put a box at the back, and when folks leave, they can put their offering in the box. And man, you'd have thought we were divining the very essence of the Trinity in that class. Folks began to argue about where you put the offering. Oh, you put it up front. Put it before the sermon. Put it after the sermon. You put it here. You, you got to have it in the service. And then that led to other conversations. Well, y'all were going to have communion, but why are you doing it by intention? Don't you know the Lord intended it on silver trays and tiny cups? These kind of conversations just started to happen. Why in the world would you say, why would you have Elvis Presley's version of that song? Don't you know David Crowder Band did a better one? These kind of conversations began to happen. And before long, Dr. York interrupted all of us and he said, you know, you're all worried about the wrong things. You're worried about the pieces of a worship service. And you've missed the point of worship. And I think, I think that's what the prophet Isaiah is really getting at the heart of here. In his words to the people of Judah on the edge of exile. Now this prophet Isaiah is writing toward the end of the 7th century B.C., toward the beginning of the 6th century B.C., right before this land is going to be taken over by Babylon, the temple raised to the ground. And in that day, there was a growing disparity between the elites, the, the, the higher-ups in Jerusalem, those who lived within the shadow of the temple and the palace, and those who had nothing, the poor, those who lived farther out. And Isaiah calls attention to this, to the, the king in the palace, to the priest and the Levites in the temple who say, well, we're doing all the right things. We are checking all the right boxes for worship. And Isaiah says, no, no, you've missed the point. You're arguing over the pieces of worship and you're missing the point about what it means to be true worshipers of God, of Yahweh. Because true worship, the prophet says, requires more from us than just attendance and a conscription to religious ritual. True worship reflects the calling of God on our lives. And that's about a whole lot more than just how you do the things you do. That true worship is not the end-all, be-all, but rather functions as a piece of the greater whole of a life of faith. It's like the, the young man who decided to be a baker. He just got the, the itch, said, I know what I'm going to do the rest of my life. I'm going to be a baker, and I know how I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm going to sell my grandma's secret chocolate pound cake. And so he goes to his grandmother, says, Grandma, I've decided I'm going to be a baker, and I've decided I'm going to make my fortune selling your pound cake. Grandma says, well, that's sweet, honey, but I don't share that recipe with everybody. But you're my grandson. I can see you're passionate about it. She goes over to the shelf. She pulls out the old church cookbook, and it's right there, right between the Weenie Mac and, you know, somebody's chicken casserole, folded up on a little scrap of paper, maybe torn off a Cool Whip tub or something, written out in her handwriting. She hands it to him. Don't lose it, it's the only one. He takes it home, he laminates it, makes copies, sleeps with it at night, reads it backwards and forwards, has it tattooed on his bicep so he can read it in the mirror, you know. And he's got that recipe down. He goes, he doesn't go even to Walmart, y'all, he goes to Whole Foods. Where eggs are $3 a piece. And he goes and he buys the best ingredients. He gets all the best stuff, right? Lays it all out on the counter. And then in his mind, he closes his eyes and he starts to recite the recipe. So many cups of flour, so many sticks of butter, so many eggs. But he doesn't know what to do with it. He forgot, oh, you need a bowl to mix all this stuff in. But the recipe didn't say a bowl. But what does it mean to whisk vigorously? How what? what, what, how, what? You need an oven? It's not in the recipe. It's just a part. It's a part of the whole thing. That's the same way with worship. The people of Judah had fallen into this routine of thinking that what God required of them, well, just show up, 
Go to temple. Give your offering. We even make exceptions for it. You can read in the book of Deuteronomy where the people made exceptions for it. You don't have any turtle doves? That's fine. You're coming from a long way. Just bring some pocket change. We'll sell them to you in the temple. This is what Jesus is overturning the tables for in the Gospels. They decided this was more important. You've got to set it all up, sell the, sell the right sacrifices, make sure we've got these stamped and approved by the priest so that they can sell them. Just show up to the temple, make the right offerings, remember the holidays, uh, it's Sabbath, so don't walk around your house, don't work. That one should be pretty easy not to do. Just keep all the religious rituals in check. Even the really important ones like whole burnt offerings that only the rich folks could do. And so with this going on, the prophet says, you've missed the point. And he says, what to me, this is the word of the Lord, what is to me is the multitude of your sacrifices. I've had enough of your burnt offerings. I don't delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to before me, who asked this from your hand? I didn't ask this from you. God said, I asked more from this, more of this from you, more than this from you. Even your celebrations, your incense, abominations to me. New moon, Sabbath, calling of convocations. I can't endure this, these solemn assemblies with iniquity. The people of Judah had fallen into this way of thinking that, well, what matters is showing up. What matters is just checking the boxes of religious ritual and righteousness, and I'll be good. Never mind that just outside their door, people were literally dying. Their people. They had it in their mind that, well, what we do is we built this temple and we have this entire tribe of Levites and an entire class of people called priests to handle all the religious stuff for us. And we just show up, stand in line, check the box, burn our offerings, go home, read the Psalms, memorize the prayers, and we're good. But God says, when you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. And even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Do you think Isaiah was popular with the people? He says, he says you think this is the way it goes, but God is saying, I need more. I want more. This isn't what I want from you. The people have fallen into this apathetic practices of worship. Show up, stand in line, give your offering, burn your cows. Spill the blood. Go home and you're okay. They believed that that was what God required of them. And I don't think we should be too hard on them. That's what religion tends to do, is it tends to systematize things. I heard someone tell a, a little, little fable about God and the devil walking down the road and they came upon a, a, an idea. They came upon a, a good deed. And God went to pick it up and the devil said, no, let me organize that for you. That's what religion tends to do. We take what God calls us to do and we, we well, we got to hang some stuff on it and make it a system and make it this. And this is what the people of Judah had done. We can't blame them. We do it ourselves. We took the, world call, they took the call of God, put it in a temple and said, that's where it needs to be. But it's not the whole of everything. That true worship functions as a piece of the greater whole of a life of faith. Because God desires more from us than just that. That true worship lives on and through our obedience to the call of God. It's not just about the, the gilded temples, the scrolls, the lampstands. It's a call to obedience. This really sort of hit home for me a few weeks ago, literally hit home. We were down in South Alabama, went out to visit my dad. Same dirt road, it's always been dirt, it will be dirt. Jesus will come back and will have to wear, not wear his shoes on that road. It's always going to be dirt. Same dirt road Grandma has lived on since the 60s. Dad moved next door when I was a kid, moved his trailer up right on Granddaddy's old vegetable garden. We pulled into Dad's house, and there at the end of Grandma's driveway was a for sale sign. Now, my dad sold that house to my uncle after my grandma died, and then my, grandma, my uncle got remarried, and the house has just sort of slowly decayed and fallen apart. But it's still there. 
And as long as it was there, and as long as nobody else was living in it, I thought to myself, well, that's, that's it. That's sort of like the, the entombed memory of my grandmother. This old Jim Walter brick house with a red camellia on the corner and the hydrangeas around the back. And granddaddy's front end pit in the backyard. That's, that's grandma's house. But now there's a for sale sign. Someone else is going to take that. And it's not going to be there for me anymore. My dad said something pretty wise. He tends to trip over that every once in a while. He said, son, it's just material thing. It's just a house. It's just brick, rotted wood, and some old bushes. That's all it is. And he's right, because it's about so much more than that. That grandma lives on in my memories, my cousin's memories, and the way that I live my life. I think it's a lesson we can take with us, and the people of God should take with us. That the people of Judah would soon find out it's not about this great temple that Solomon had built. But Nebuchadnezzar the first, second would come in and just lay it down. Nothing would be left but just a few pieces of a western wall. That's it. It's all gone. They'd find out. God's not about the box we put him in. God's not about the religious ritual. God's not about the checking of the proper boxes to make sure we can call it worship. It's about obedience and willingness to follow. That's what the prophet says from God in verse 18. Come now, let us argue it out. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though you, though they are like red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you're willing and obedient to follow God, you get to stay. Hold up that end of the covenant here in Judah. But if you refuse and rebel, you will be devoured by the sword. And we know that's what happened. That's what happened. God calls them out, challenges them, say, come on now, let's talk this out. Let's be, let's be real about this. If you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But that's the rub, isn't it? Willing and obedient to what? To whom? To God? But what does that mean, we might ask? But God doesn't leave us hanging. The prophet in the scriptures don't leave us hanging. They tell us. That true worship finds its ultimate expression in a life lived in the love of God and others. That's what it is. It's a life lived in its ultimate expression of love of God and others. You can't shake a stick at the Bible without hitting a verse that says that. You've all heard Jesus' parable of the mustard seed, yes? Yes. Did you know there's another parable of the mustard seed? They tell it in China. It's about a woman who had a baby, her firstborn son. And when he was just a few months old, the baby died. And so the mother wrapped the child close to her body and went to every medicine man, every doctor, every, every elder in the village. Can you help my son? He's died. Can you bring him back? Can you heal my son? Can you bring him back to life? And someone in the village said, well, there's a wise old man who lives way, way up on the mountain. I bet if anyone can, he can. And so the woman climbed up the mountain into this little shack. There was the man sitting there. She went up to him and said, the, the people in the village said that you can heal my son. He said, well, yes, yes, that's true. But I need five mustard seeds. She said, that's easy. Five mustard seeds? He goes, oh, but five mustard seeds from a house that has never experienced death. She went back down into the village, knocked on the first door, man answered the door. I'm sorry, sir, I know this is crazy, but do you have any mustard seeds? Yeah, matter of fact, I do. Oh, that's good. And I, this is a weird question. I know, I'm sorry. But have you ever experienced death? The man solemnly said, well, yeah. I lost my wife just last year. Come on in, I'll tell you about it. The man told her about his wife, how much he loved her, how the cancer had come. She said, thank you, but I need mustard seeds from a house that has never experienced death. So she goes next door, knocks on the door, woman answers. Do you have any mustard seeds? I know that's a crazy question. Yes, I do. I do. Do you have five? Oh, yeah, I do. Well, I know this is crazy. Have you ever experienced death? Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
First two babies, stillborn. Yeah, yeah. I'd come on, I'd love to, I'd love to tell, meet, meet my kids I have now. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to. Every door, every person, every home, someone had experienced death. The way that story ends is that she finally loosened her child's body from hers, buried him in the ground, went back up the mountain and told the man, I realize everyone is affected by death. It changed her perspective. It went from being about her to about everyone else. Went from being about her to realizing she's a part of something bigger, something more going on. And I think sometimes, I think sometimes we need to be reminded of that. Particularly in our worship of God. The people of Judah, I think, again, we can't blame them, had fallen into this habit of thinking, well, as long as I show up at the temple, as long as I give my sacrifices, as long as I participate in the life of the temple and the cultic practices of faith, that I will be okay. But meanwhile, all around them, the widows, the orphans, and oppressed were dying. The gap between the haves and the have-nots was growing at an alarming rate. And so God, through the prophet, says to the people, Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes, cease to do evil, learn to do good. And all that sounds great. See, stop being evil stop doing, and start doing good. But, but, but preacher, what does that mean? Isaiah, what do you mean? Because... I can make anything sound like I'm doing good. I can make anything sound like I'm stopping evil. But the prophet, just like so many in his day, has an answer for that. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. James himself, Jesus' brother, would write in his epistle, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. The people of Judah came to the temple. They came to offer their worship and their rituals and their sacrifices. And God says, you've missed it. This isn't the point of all of it. The point of all of this is a call to action that our faith does not end with a cognitive agreement to a number of ideas, doctrines, or set of beliefs. That the practice of our faith isn't just about singing songs once a week, sitting through a sermon every now and then, praying over dinner, or memorizing Bible verses. And all those things are good, and all those things are right, but if it ends there, it's not the whole. The call from God is a call to take our worship to its ultimate conclusion. To put feet to our faith. To, as the prophet says, cease doing evil. Learn to do good. To seek justice. To rescue the oppressed. To defend the orphan. And plead for the widow. May we all seek to practice this pure and undefiled religion. May we all seek to be people who do not allow the rhythms of our religious life to become all that we have of faith. To just point to the checks in the boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is my worship. This is my faith. And in this room and in this time right now, may we all be people who don't let worship end when we walk out that door but to carry it with us, carry it in our hearts, our souls, but maybe more importantly, or as much, in our hands and our feet to the world that God calls us to out there, beyond this place. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, giver of the Holy Spirit. Lord, as you come to call us, 
to, yes, a life that is grounded in worship. Lord, help us to see that worship is the, or the place where maybe we begin, or maybe it's a part of the whole, but that you call us to a life of faith. Lord, we know that we fail sometimes. We know we fail most times. Lord, that's why we need you. If we could do this on our own, we wouldn't need here. We wouldn't need this time, this place. These words of Scripture are one another. But Lord, we confess even now we can't do it on our own. So come, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts to show us that we are incapable. But you call us still. And you walk alongside us, out ahead of us, within us, and behind us. Always calling us to a fuller life of worship, a fuller life of faith. Be with us now, Holy Spirit, as we discern what it is you're calling us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.